what they achieved is is singular, never right. been done before. Just to put in perspective, hundred thousand GPUs. That's you know easily the fastest supercomputer on the planet as one cluster. Um, a supercomputer uh, that you would build would take normally three years to plan, right? And then they deliver the equipment, and it takes one year to get it all working. Yes. We're talking about 19 days. Jensen, nice glasses. Hey, yeah, you too. <laughs> it's great to be with you. Yeah, I got uh, my ugly glasses on just like come you. Come on, those aren't ugly. These are pretty good. They're, do you like the red ones better? There's uh, something only your family could love. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Friday, October 4th. We're at the NVIDIA headquarters just down the street from Altimeter. Welcome. Um, thank you. Thank you. And we have our investor meeting, our annual investor meeting on Monday, where we're going to debate all the consequences of AI, how fast we're scaling intelligence. And I couldn't think of anybody better really to kick it off with than you. Appreciate that. Um, as both a shareholder as a thought partner, kicking ideas back and forth. You really make us smarter. Um, and we're just grateful for the friendship. So thanks for being here. Happy to be here. You know, this year, the, the, the theme is scaling intelligence to AGI. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty mind boggling that when we did this two years ago, we did it on the age of AI. Mm -hmm. And that was two months before ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. And to think about all that's changed. So I thought yeah. we would kick it off with a thought experiment and mm -hmm. maybe a prediction. Yeah. If I colloquially think of AGI as that personal assistant in my pocket, <laughs> if I think of AGI as that colloquial I'll assistant get, in my pocket, I was getting used to it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that knows everything about me, mm -hmm. um, that has perfect memory of me, that can communicate with me, um, that can book a hotel for me, or maybe book a doctor's appointment for me. Mm -hmm. When you look at the rate of change in the world today, when do you think we're going to have that personal assistant in our pocket? Soon, in some form. Yeah. Yeah, soon, in some form. And that, that, uh, uh, that assistant will, will get better over time. That's the beauty of technology as we right. know it. And so, so I think in the beginning, it'll, it'll be uh, uh, quite useful, uh, but not perfect. And then it gets more and more perfect over time, like all technology. When we look at the rate of change, I think Elon has said, the only thing that really matters is rate of change. It, exactly. sure fe it sure feels to us like the rate of change has accelerated dramatically is the fastest rate of change we've ever seen on these questions because we've been around the rim like you on, on AI for a decade now, you, you even longer. Is this the fastest rate of change you've seen in your career? It is because we've reinvented computing. You know, a lot of this is happening because we, we drove the marginal cost of computing down by... 100,000 X over the course of 10 years. Moore's law would have been about 100 X. Yeah. And, and we did it, we did it in several ways. We did it by one, introducing accelerated computing, taking, taking what is work that is uh, not, very, not very effective on CPUs and put it on top of GPUs. We did it by uh, inventing new numerical precisions. We did it by new architectures, inventing the tensor core. Uh, the way systems are, for, are formulated, NVLink um, added uh, insanely, insane, insanely fast memories, HBM, and uh, uh, scaling things up with uh, uh, NVLink and InfiniBand uh, and, and working across the entire stack. Right. Right? Basically, everything that, that I describe about how NVIDIA does things uh, led to a super Moore's Law rate of innovation. Now, the thing that's, that's really make, amazing is that that as a result of that, we went from uh, human programming to machine learning. Mm. And the amazing thing about machine learning is that machine learning can learn pretty fast, right. as it turns out. And so as we, uh, as we reformulated the way we distribute computing, you know, uh, we, we did a lot of well, parallelism of all kinds, right? Tensor parallelism, pipeline parallelism, right. parallelism of all, of all kinds. And, and uh, uh, we became good at, good at uh, 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 inventing new algorithms on top of that, and uh, new training methods, and and all of this tech, all of this invention is right. compounding on top of each exactly. other. As a result, right? And back in the old days, if you look at the way uh, Moore's law was working, the software was static. Right. It was pre it was pre compiled as shrink wrapped, put into right. a store. It was static, and the hardware underneath was growing at Moore's law rate. Right. 
Right. Now we've got the whole stack growing, right? Innovating across the whole stack. And so I think that that's the, now, now all of a sudden we're seeing scaling. Uh, that is, that is extraordinary, of course. But, but, um, uh, we used to talk about pre-trained models and scaling at that level and how we're doubling the model size and doubling, therefore right. appropriately doubling the data size. And as a result, the computing capacity necessary is, uh, increasing by a factor of four every year. Right. That was a big deal. Right. But now we're seeing scaling with post training mm -hmm. and we're seeing scaling at inference. Isn't that right? Right. 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 And so people used to think that pre-training was, was hard right. and the inference was easy. Now everything is hard, right. Right. which is kind of sensible. You know, the idea right. that, that all of, all of human thinking is, is one shot is kind of ridiculous. And so there's, there must be a concept of fast thinking and slow thinking and, and reasoning and reflection and iteration and simulation and all that. Um, and that now it's coming in. Yeah. I think to that point, you know, one of the most misunderstood things about NVIDIA is how deep the true NVIDIA moat is, right? I think there's a notion out there that, you know, if some, as soon as someone invents a new chip, a, yeah. a better chip that, you know, that they've won. But the truth is you've been spending the past decade building the full stack from the GPU to the CPU to the yeah. networking and especially the software and libraries that enable applications yeah. to run on NVIDIA. Yeah. So I think you spoke you know, to that, but you know, when you think about NVIDIA's moat today, yeah. right? Do you think NVIDIA's moat today is greater or, or, or smaller than it was three mm -hmm. to four years ago? Well, I appreciate you, you recognizing how computing has changed. In fact, the reason why people thought, and many still do, that you designed a better chip, it has more flops, has more flips and flops and bits <laughs> and bites, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and you, you, see the, you see their keynote slides, and it's got all these flips and flops and yes. you know, bar charts and things like that. And, and that's all good. I mean, look, uh, horsepower does matter. Yes. So these things fundamentally do matter. However, however, um, unfortunately, that's old thinking. Mm -hmm. It is old thinking in the sense that the software was, was uh, uh, some application running on Windows and the software is static, mm -hmm. right. which means that, that the, the best way for you to improve the system is just making faster and faster ships. Mm -hmm. But we, we realized that, that machine learning is not human programming. Mm -hmm. Machine learning is not about just the software, it's about the entire data pipeline. Mm -hmm. It's about, in fact, the flywheel of machine learning is the most important thing. So how do you think about uh, enabling this flywheel on the one hand uh, and enabling data scientists and researchers to be productive in this flywheel? Mm -hmm. And that flywheel is, is, uh, starts at the very, very beginning. A, a lot of people don't even realize that it takes AI Mm -hmm. to curate data mm -hmm. to teach an AI. Mm -hmm. And that AI alone is pretty complicated. Yeah. And is that and AI so, itself is improving? Is it also accelerating, you know, again, when we think about the competitive advantage, yeah. right? It's combinatorial of all it's, these it's systems. Exactly, exactly. And, and that was exactly going to lead to that. Because of smarter AIs to curate the data, right. we now even have synthetic data generation and all kinds of different ways of of curating data, presenting data to, and so before you even get the training, you've got massive amounts of data processing involved. Mm -hmm. And so, so people think about, oh, uh, PyTorch, that's the beginning end of the world, and it, it was very important. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, before PyTorch is a month amount of work. After PyTorch is a amount of work, and and that the think about the flywheel is really the way you ought to think. You know, how do I think about this entire flywheel, and how do I design a computing system? a computing architecture that helps you take this flywheel and be as effective as possible. It's not one size mm -hmm. slice of an application mm -hmm. training. Does that make sense? Yep. That's just one step. Yep. Okay. Every step along that flywheel is hard. Mm. And so the first thing that you should do, instead of thinking about uh, how do I make Excel faster? How do I make, you know, doom faster? Right. <laughs> that was kind of the old days. Isn't yeah. that right? Yeah. Now you have to think about how do I make this flywheel faster? Mm. And this flywheel has a whole bunch of different steps. And there's nothing easy about machine learning, right. as you guys know. There's nothing easy about what OpenAI does yeah. or X does or Gemini and the team that DeepMind does. I mean, there's nothing easy about what they do. And so we decided, look, this is really what you ought to be thinking about. 
This is the entire process. You want you want to accelerate every part of that. You want to respect Amdahl's law. You want to he, he, Amdahl's law would suggest. Well, if this is thirty percent of the time, and I accelerated that by a factor of three, mm-hmm. I didn't really accelerate the entire process by right. that that much. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Right. And it, you really want to create a system that accelerates every single step of that because only in doing the whole thing can you really materially improve that cycle time. And that flywheel, that's that, 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 that rate of learning is really in the end what causes the exponential rise. And so our, what I'm trying to say is that our perspective about, you know, a company's perspective about what you're really doing manifests itself into the product. Right. Mm. And notice, I've been talking about this flywheel, you know. The entire cycle, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Right. And we accelerate everything. Right. Right now, right now, the main focus is video. Uh, a, a lot of people are focused on, 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 on physical AI and video processing. Right. Just imagine that front end. Right. The, the terabytes per second of data that are coming into the system. Mm-hmm. Give me an example of a pipeline that is going to ingest all of that data, right. prepare it for training in the first place. Yeah. So that entire thing is CUDA accelerated. Yeah. And people are only thinking about text models today. Yeah. But the future is, you know, this uh, video models as yeah. well as, you know, using, you know, some of these text models like O1 to really process a lot of that data before we even get there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, language it, models are going to be involved in every single... Yeah. yeah. With, it took us took the industry enormous technology and effort to train a language model, to train these large language models. Now we're using a large language model in every single exactly. step of the way. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty phenomenal. I don't mean to be overly simplistic about this, but again, you know, we hear it all the time from investors, right? Yes, but what about custom ASICs? Yes, but yeah. their competitive mode is going to be pierced by this. What I hear you saying is that in a combinatorial system, yeah. the advantage grows over time. So I heard you say that our advantage is greater today than it was three to four years ago because we're improving every component and that's combinatorial. Is that, you know, when you think about, for example, as a business case study, Intel, right? who had a dominant mode, a dominant position in the stack relative to where you are today. Perhaps just, you know, again, boil it down a little bit. You know, compare, contrast your competitive advantage to maybe the competitive advantage they had at the peak of their cycle. Well, Intel is extraordinary. Um, Intel is extraordinary because they were probably the first company that was uh incredibly good at manufacturing, um, process engineering, manufacturing, right. and that one click above mm-hmm. manufacturing, which is building the chip. Right. And designing the chip and, and architecting the chip um, uh, in, in the x86 architecture uh, and building faster and faster x86 chips, that was their brilliance. Right. And they, they fused that with manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Um, our company is a little different in the sense that, and we recognize this, that, that in fact, parallel processing mm. doesn't require every transistor to be excellent. Mm. Serial processing requires every transistor to be excellent. Parallel processing requires lots and lots of transistors to be more cost effective. Mm. I'd rather have 10 times more transistors, 20% slower, right. than 10 times less transistors, 20% faster. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. They would like the opposite. Mm-hmm. And so single-threaded performance, single-threaded processing and parallel processing was very different. And so we, we observed that, in fact, our world is not about being better going down. We want to be very good, as, as mm-hmm. good as we can be. But it's, our world is really about much better going up. Mm-hmm. Parallel computing, parallel processing is hard because uh, every single algorithm requires a different way of refactoring and re-architecting the algorithm for the architecture. Right. What people don't realize is that you can have uh, three different ISAs, CPU ISAs. They all have their own C compilers. You could take you could take software and compile down to that right. ISA. That's not possible in accelerated computing. That's not possible in parallel computing. The company who comes up with the architecture has to come up with their own OpenGL. Right. So we revolutionized deep learning because of our 
domain-specific library called KuDNN. Without KuDNN, nobody talks about KuDNN because it's one layer underneath right. PyTorch and you know, and and TensorFlow and back in the old days, Cafe and Theano and and now Triton and there's a whole bunch of different different frameworks. And so that domain-specific library KuDNN, a domain-specific library called Optics. We have a domain-specific library called KuQuantum, yeah. um, Rapids. Uh, the the list of you know. Aerial for for uh, industry uh, specific algorithms that sit below you know that PyTorch layer that everybody's focused on. Like I've heard oftentimes, well, you know, if LLMs, if I didn't, if we didn't invent that, uh, no application on top could work. Right. Yeah. You guys right. understand what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So the mathematics is really what Nvidia is really good at is algorithm. Right. That in, that fusion between the the science above the architecture on the bottom. That's what we're really right. good at. Right. Yeah. There's all this attention now on inference, yeah. finally. Um, but I remember, you know, two two years ago, Brad and I had dinner with you, and we asked you the question, you know, do do you think your moat will be as strong in inference as it is in training? Yeah. And and I, I'm sure I said it would be it would be greater. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And 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 you touched upon a lot of these elements just now. Just you know the composability between, or you know the we don't know that total mix at one point and to a customer, it's very important to be able to be flexible in between. That's right. Um, but can you just touch upon, you know, yeah. now that we're in this era of inference? Yeah. It was, you know, inference, training is inferencing at, at scale. I mean, you're right. right. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, uh, if you, if you infer, if you train well, it is very likely you'll inference well. Mm -hmm. If you built it on this architecture, Without any consideration, it will run on this architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, you could you could still go and optimize it for other architectures, but at the very minimum, since it's already been architect, you know, built on Nvidia, it will run on Nvidia. Now, the other aspect, of course, is just kind of, you know, capital investment aspect, which is when you're training new models, you want your best new gear to be used for training, mm -hmm. which leaves behind gear that you used yesterday. Well, that gear is perfect for inference. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's, a, there's a trail of free gear. Mm -hmm. There's a trail of free infrastructure behind the new infrastructure that's CUDA compatible. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're, we're very disciplined about making sure that we're compatible throughout so that everything that we leave behind will continue to be excellent. Now, we also put a lot of energy into continuously reinventing new algorithms so that when the time comes, the Hopper architecture is two, three, four times better than when they bought it, mm -hmm. so that that, you, that infrastructure continues to be really effective. Mm -hmm. And so all of the work that we do, uh, improving new algorithms, new frameworks, notice it helps every, every single install base that we have. Hopper is better for it. Ampere's better for it. Even Volta's better for it. Yeah. Okay, and and I think Sam was just telling me that that they had just uh, decommissioned the the Volta infrastructure yeah. that they have at OpenAI recently. And so, so I, I think it's uh, we we leave behind this trail of install base. Just like all computing, install base matters. And Nvidia's in, in every single cloud. We're in, you know on prem and, in, and mm -hmm. at, all the way out to the edge. And so the 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 Vila, you know, vision language model that been created in the cloud works perfectly at the edge on a robots mm -hmm. without modification. Right. It's all CUDA compatible. Right. And so, so I think this, this idea of architecture compatibility was important for large, it's no different for iPhones and no different for anything else. I think the install base is really important for inference. But the thing that, that I really, really, um, uh, we really benefit from is because we're div we're working on training these large language models and the new architectures of it, uh, we're 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 able to think about how do we create architectures that's excellent at inference someday when the time comes. And so we've been thinking about about uh, iterative models for for uh, reasoning models and how do we create uh, very very uh, interactive inference experiences for this right. personal agent of yours. Right. You don't want to say something and have to go off and think about it for a while. You wanted to interact with you right. quite quickly. Right. Right. So how do we create such a thing? And what came out of it was MVLink. Right. Hmm. You know, MVLink so that we could take uh, these systems that are excellent for training, uh, but when you're done with it, the, the inference performance is ex ex exceptional. Mm -hmm. And so you want to you want to optimize for this time to first token. Right. And time to first token is 
is um, uh, insanely hard to do, actually, because time to first token requires a lot of bandwidth. But if your context is also rich, then um, you need a lot of flops. Yeah. And so you need an infinite amount of bandwidth, infinite amount of flops at the same time mm-hmm. in order to achieve just a few millisecond response time. And so that, that architecture is really hard to do. And we invented uh, Grace Blackwell and Link for that. Mm-hmm. Right. In the spirit of time, I have more questions about that, but-, but well, don't but, worry, don't worry about the time. Hey guys, <laughs> hey, 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 listen, Janine. Yeah. Look. Let's do it until it's right. Let's do it until right. There you go. I love it, I love it. So, you, you know, I was at dinner yeah. um, with Andy Jassy See, earlier. See, now we don't have to worry about the time. <laughs> earlier, with Andy Jassy earlier this week. And Andy said, you know, we've got Tranium, uh, you know, coming and Infrencia coming. And I think most people, um, again, view these as a problem for NVIDIA. But in the very next breath, he said, NVIDIA is a huge and important partner to us and will remain a huge and important partner for us as far as I can see into the future. The world runs on NVIDIA, right? So when you think about the custom ASICs that are being built, that are going to go after targeted application, maybe the inference accelerator at Meta, maybe, you know, Tranium at Amazon, uh, you know, or Google's TPUs. And then you think about the supply shortage that you have today. Um, do any of those things change that dynamic, right? Or are they complements to the systems that they're all buying from you? We're just doing different things. Yes. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to accomplish different things. Mm-hmm. You know, what NVIDIA is trying to do is build a computing platform for this new world, this machine learning world, this generative AI world, this agentic AI world. We're trying to, we're trying to create, you know, as you know, in the, what, what's just prof- so deeply profound is after 60 years of computing, uh, we reinvented the entire right. computing stack. Uh, the way you write software from programming to machine learning, the way that you process software from CPUs to GPU, uh, the way that, the way that, uh, uh, the, the applications from software to artificial intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, uh, software tools to artificial intelligence. So, so every aspect of the computing stack and the technology stack has been changed. You know, what we would like to do is to, to create a computing platform that's available everywhere. Mm-hmm. And this is really the, the, the complexity of what we do. The complexity of what we do is if you think about what we do, we, we're building an entire AI infrastructure and we think of it as one computer. Right. I've said before, mm-hmm. the data center is now the unit yeah. of computing. Yeah. Yeah. To me, when I think about a computer, I'm not thinking about that chip. Right. I'm thinking about this thing. That's my mental model. And all the software and all the orchestration, all the machinery that's inside, that's my, mach- that's my computer. Right. And we're trying to build a new one every year. Yeah. That's insane. insane. Nobody has ever done that before. Right. We're trying to build a brand new one every single year and every single year, we deliver two or three times more performance. Mm-hmm. As a result, every single year, we reduce the cost by two or three times. Every single year, we improve the energy efficiency by two or three times, Incredible. right? And so we ask our customers, don't buy everything at one time, right. buy a little every year, right. okay? And the re- reason for that, we want them cost average into the future. Mm-hmm. All of it's architecturally compatible, okay? Now, so that building that alone at the pace that we're doing is in, incredibly hard. Now, the double part, the double hard part, is then we take that all of that, and instead of selling it as a infrastructure or selling it as a service, we disaggregate all of it mm-hmm. and we integrate it into GCP. We integrate it into AWS. We integrate it into Azure. We integrate it into X. We integ- Does that make sense? Yes. And so everybody's integration is different. Mm. We got to get. We have to get all of our architectural libraries and all of our algorithms and all of our frameworks and integrate it into theirs. We get our security system integrated into theirs. We get our networking integrated into theirs. Isn't that right? Right. Then we do basically ten integrations, mm. and we do this every single year. Right. Now that is the miracle. <laughs> that is the miracle. Why were you, I mean? It, it's madness. It's madness that you're trying to do I'm this every year. Thinking about so, it. So, yeah. so, so, what drove you? to do it every year. And then related to that, you know, Clark's just back from Taipei and Korea and Japan when meeting with all your supply partners yeah. who you have decade long relationships with. Yeah. How important are, are those relationships yeah. to again, the combinatorial math that builds that competitive moat? Yeah, that's, that's, um, 
when you when you break it down systematically, the more you guys break it down, the yeah. more everybody breaks it down, the more amazed that they are. Yes. And and um, how is it possible that the entire uh, ecosystem of electronics today is dedicated in working with us to build ultimately this cube of a computer integrated into all of these different ecosystems and the coordination is so seamless. So there's obviously APIs and, and methodologies and business processes and design rules that we've propagated backwards and methodologies and architectures and APIs that we propagated forward. Mm. That have been hardened for decades. Hardened for decades, yeah, and also evolving as we go. And right. um, but they, they, th these APIs have to come together. Right, right. When the time comes, all these things in Taiwan, you know, all over the world being manufactured, they're gonna land somewhere in in Azure's data center. They're gonna come together. They click, 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 click. And, and so, <laughs> someone just calls an uh, OpenAI API, and it just works. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah there's it's a kind whole of craziness, chain. right? There's a whole chain. And so that's what we yeah. invented. That's what yeah. we invented. This yeah. this this massive infrastructure of computing. Yeah. The whole planet is working with us on it. It's integrated into everywhere. It's you, you could sell it through Dell. You could sell it through HPE. It's hosted in the cloud. It's in. Uh, it's all the way out at the edge. Uh, right. People use it in robotic systems now, robo and you know, human robots. They're in self-driving cars. They're all architecturally compatible. Pretty well, kind of craziness. It's, yeah. it's it's craziness. Clark, I don't want to. I don't want you to leave the impression I didn't an answer the question. In fact, I did. Um, what I meant by that, when uh, re yes. relating to your ASIC, is is um. The way to think about it, we're just doing something different. Yes. Um, as a company, as a company, we want to be situa situationally aware, and I'm very situationally mm -hmm. aware of everything around our company and our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm aware of all the people doing alternative things and and what they're doing, and 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 sometimes sometimes it's adversarial to us, sometimes it's not. Um, I'm super aware of it, mm -hmm. but that doesn't change what the purpose of the company is. Yeah. The singular purpose of the company is to build an architecture mm -hmm. that a platform that could be everywhere. Right. That is our goal. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to take any share from anybody. NVIDIA is a market maker, mm -hmm. not share taker. Mm -hmm. If you look at our company slides, we don't, we don't show, in, not one day does this company talk about market share, not inside. Mm -hmm. All we're talking about is how do we create the next thing? What's the next problem we can solve in that flywheel? How can we do a better job for people? Mm -hmm. How do we take that, that flywheel that used to take about a year? How do we crank, crank it down to about a month? Yes. You yes. know, what's the speed of light of that? <clears throat> Isn't that right? And so we're thinking about all these different things. But the one thing we're not, we're not too, we're situationally aware of everything, but we're certain that the, what our mission is, is very singular. The only question is whether that mission is necessary. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. You know, and all companies, all great companies ought to have that at its core. It's about right. what are you doing? For sure. The only question, is it necessary? Is it valuable? Right. Is it impactful? Does it help people? Yeah. And and I am certain that you're a developer, you're, you're, you're a generative AI startup, and, and you're about to decide how to become a company. The one choice that you don't have to make is... Which one of the A6 do I support? If you just support a CUDA, you know you could go everywhere. You could always change your mind later. Right. But we're the on-ramp to the world of AI. Isn't that right? Once you decide to come onto our platform, the other decisions you could defer. You could always build your own ASIC later. Right. You know, we're not against that. We're not offended by any of that. Um, when I work with, when we work with um, all the GCPs, uh, the GCPs, Azure, we present our roadmap to them years in advance. Right. They don't present their ASIC roadmap to us and it doesn't ever offend us. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? We, we create, we're in the, if you have a sole purpose and your purpose is meaningful and your mission is, is, is dear to you and is dear to, to everybody else, then you could be transparent. Notice my roadmap is transparent at GTC. My roadmap goes way deeper mm -hmm. to our friends at Azure and AWS and others. Um, we have no trouble doing any of that, even as they're building their own ASIC. I think, you know, when, when people observe the business, you said recently that the demand for Blackwell is insane. You said one of the hardest parts of your job is the emotional toll 
of saying no to people in a world that um, has a shortage of the compute that you, that you can produce and have on offer. But critics say this is just a moment in time, right? They, they say, this is just like Cisco in 2000, we're overbuilding fiber, it's gonna be boom and bust. You know, I, I think about the start of 23 when we were having dinner. The forecast for NVIDIA at that dinner in January of 23 was that you would do 26 billion of revenue uh, for the year 2023. You did 60 billion, right? The, the 25 people- just, Let's just, let, let, let tr the truth be known, yeah. that is the single greatest failure <laughs> of forecasting the world has ever seen. Right, right, you, right. Can right. we all can we all at least admit what, what, that? What, 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 to me, yeah. to that me- That was my takeaway. I just got- <laughs> and, that was, and that was, we got so excited in November 22 <laughs> because we had folks like Mustafa from Inflection and Noam from Character coming in our office talking about investing in their companies. And they said, well, if you can't <clears throat> pencil out investing in our companies, then buy NVIDIA because everybody in the world is trying to get NVIDIA chips to build these applications that are gonna change the world. And of course the Cambrian moment occurred with ChatGPT and notwithstanding that fact, these 25 analysts were so focused on the crypto winner that they couldn't get their head around an imagination of what was, what was happening in the world, okay? So it ended up, being way bigger. You say in very plain English, the demand is insane for Blackwell, that it's going to be that way for as far as you can, you know, for as far as you can see. Of course, the future is unknown and unknowable, but why are the critics so wrong that, it, that, that this isn't going to be the Cisco-like situation of overbuilding in, the, in, in, in 2000? Yeah. Um, the best way to to think about the future is reason reason about it from first principles. Correct. Okay, so so the, the question is, what are the first principles of what we're doing? Number one, what are we doing? What are we doing? Um, the first thing that we are doing is we are reinventing computing. Do we not? We yes. just said that. The way that computing will be done in the future will be highly machine learned. Yes. Highly machine learned. Okay, almost everything that we do, almost every single application, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Photoshop, Premiere, you, you, you know, AutoCAD. You, you give me your favorite application right. that was all hand, hand engineered. I yeah. promise you it will be highly right. machine learned in the future. Right. Isn't that right. right? And so all these tools will be, and, and on top of that, you're going to have machines, agents that you help you use them. Right. Okay. And so we know this for a fact at this point. Right. right? Isn't that right. right? We've reinvented computing. We're not going back. The entire computing technology stack has been reinvented. Okay, so now that we've done that, we said that software is going to be different. What software can write is going to be different. How we use software will be different. So let's let's now acknowledge that. Those, those are my ground truth now. Yes. Now the question, therefore, is what happens? And so let's go back and let's just take a look at how's computing done in the past. So we have a trillion dollars worth of computers in the past. We look at it, just open the door, look at the data center, and you look at it and say, are those the computers you want doing that, doing that right. future? And the answer is no. Right. right. You got all these CPUs back there. We know that what, what it can do and what it can't do. And we just know that we have a trillion dollars worth of data centers that we have to modernize. And so right now as we speak, if we were to, to have a trajectory over the next four or five years to modernize right. that old stuff, mm. that's not unreasonable, right. sensible. So we have a trillion. And you're dollars. having those conversations with the people who have to modernize it. Yeah. So and the they're modernizing thing, it on GPU. That's right. I mean, it, right, well, let's, let's make another test. You have, you have, you have uh, $50 billion of CapEx you'd like right. to spend. Option A, option B. Build CapEx for the future. Right. Or build CapEx like the past. Right. Now, um, you already have the CapEx <laughs> of the past. Right. Yeah. Right. It's sitting right there. It's not getting much better anyways. Moore's Law is largely ended. And so why rebuild that? Let's just take $50 billion, put it into generative AI. Isn't that right? right? And so now your company just got better. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of that $50 billion would you put in? Well, I would put in 100% of the $50 billion right. because I've already got four years of infrastructure behind me. That's the, of, the, of the past. Mm -hmm. And so now, now you just I just reasoned about it mm -hmm. um, from the perspective of somebody thinking about it from first principles. And that's what they're doing. Smart people are doing smart things. Now the second part is this. So, so now we have a trillion dollars worth of capacity to go build, right? Trillion dollars worth of infrastructure. What about, you know, call it $150 billion into it. Right. Okay? So we have, we have a trillion dollars of infrastructure, infrastructure to go build over the next four or five years. Well, the second thing that we observe is that 
the way that software is written is different, but how software is going to be used is different. In the future, we're going to have agents. Isn't that right? Correct. We're going to have digital employees in our company. Mm -hmm. In your inbox, you have all these little dots and these little faces. In the future, there's going to be little icons of AIs. Isn't right. that right? I'm going to be sending them. I'm going to be. I'm no longer going to program computers with C++. I'm going to program AIs with prompting. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is no different than me talking to my, you know, this morning. I, I wrote a bunch of emails before I came here. I was prompting my of course, teams. Of course. Right? Yeah. And I, I would describe the context. I would describe the, the, the fundamental constraints that I, I know of. And I would describe the mission for them. I would leave it sufficiently. Uh, I would be sufficiently directional so that they understand what I need. And I want to be clear about what the outcome should be, as clear as I can be. But I leave enough ambiguous space, on, you know, a, a creativity space so they can surprise me. Isn't that right? Absolutely. It's no different than how I prompt an AI today. Yeah. It's exactly how I prompt an AI. And so what's going to happen is, is on top of this infrastructure of IT that we're going to modernize, there's going to be a new infrastructure. This new infrastructure are going to be AI factories that operate these digital humans. Right. And they're going to be running all the time, 24-7. Mm -hmm. right. We're going to have them for all of our companies all over the world. Uh, we're going to have them in factories. We're going to have them in autonomous systems. Isn't that right? right. So there's a whole layer of computing fabric, a whole layer of what I call AI factories mm -hmm. that the world has to make that doesn't exist today at all. Right. So the question is, how big is that? Right. Unknowable at the moment, right. mm -hmm. probably a few trillion dollars. Right. Un unknowable at the moment, but as we're sitting here building in, the, the beautiful thing is the architecture for this modernizing this new data center right. and the architecture for the AI factory right. is the same. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the nice thing. And you, 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 so, made, you made this clear. You've got a trillion of old stuff you got to modernize. You at least have a trillion of new AI workloads coming on. Yeah. You're, you, give or take, you'll do $125 billion in revenue this year. You know, there was at one point somebody told you the company would never be worth more than a billion. As you sit here today, is there any reason, right, if you're only 125 billion out of a multi trillion TAM, that you're not going to have 2x the revenue, 3x the revenue in the future that you have today? Is there any reason your revenue doesn't? No. Yeah. Yeah. The, as, as you know, the, the, it's not about, it's not about um, everything is, uh, you know, companies, Companies are only limited by the size of the, the fish pond. Yeah, you know, yes, yes. a goldfish can only be so big. <laughs> and so the question is, what is our what is our fish pond? What is our pond? And that requires a little imagination. And th this is the reason why market makers think about that future, that creating that new fish pond. Um, it's hard. It's hard to to figure this out looking backwards and try to take share. Right. You know, right. share takers can only be so big. For sure. Market makers can be quite large. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And so, you know, I, I think I think the, the good fortune that our company has, has is that since the very beginning of our company, we had to invent the market for us to go swim in. Yeah. That market, and people don't realize this back then, but anymore, but, you know, we were at the, at the at ground zero of creating the 3D gaming PC market. Right. Right. We, we largely invented this market and all the ecosystem and all the, the graphics card ecosystem, we invented all that. And, and so, so the, 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 the need to invent a new market to go serve it later is something that's very comfortable for right. us. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. And speaking to somebody who's invented a new market, you know, let's shift gears a little bit to models and open AI. Open AI raised, as you know, six and a half billion dollars uh, this week. Yeah. Um, uh, at like a $150 billion valuation, we both participated yeah, re really happy for them. Really, really happy they came together. Right. Yeah, they Report did a great Sam and, and the team did a Incredible. great job. Yeah. Reports are that they'll do five billion ish of revenue or run rate revenue this year, maybe going to ten billion next year. If you look at the business today, it's about twice the revenue as Google was at, at the time of its IPO. They have two hundred fifty million. Right? Yeah, two hundred fifty million weekly average users which we estimate is twice the amount Google had at the time is of its right? IPO. Okay. Wow. And if you look at the multiple of the business, if you believe 10 billion next year, it's about 15 times the forward revenue, which is about the multiple of Google and Meta at the time of their IPO, wow. right? Yeah. When you think about a company that had zero revenue, zero weekly average users 22 months ago. Brad has an incredible command of history. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about that, 
Um, talk to us about the importance of OpenAI as a partner to you and OpenAI as a force in kind of driving forward, you know, kind of public awareness and usage around AI. Well, this, this is one of, the, one of the most consequential companies of our time. Uh, the, um, uh, a, uh, a pure play um, AI company uh, pursuing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the vision of uh, AGI right. and whatever its definition. Right. I, I almost don't think it matters uh, fully right. uh, what the definition is. Uh, nor do I, um, I, you know, really believe that that the timing matters. Right. The the one thing that I know is that that uh, AI is AI is going to have a a roadmap of capabilities over time, and that a roadmap of capabilities over time is going to be quite spectacular. Mm. And um, uh, along the way, long before it even gets to anybody's definition of AGI, we're going to put it to great use. Right. Um, all you have to do is, uh, right now as we speak, go go talk to uh, digital biologists, uh, climate tech researchers, material researchers, um, uh, physical sciences, astrophysicists, quantum chemists. Um, you go ask uh, uh, video game designers, um, uh, manufacturing uh, um, engineers. Uh, uh, roboticists, pick your favorite, right. whatever industry you want to go pick. Right. And you go deep in there and you talk to the people that matter and you ask them, has AI revolutionized the way you work? Right. And you take those data points and you come back and you <laughs> you then get to ask yourself, how skeptical, skeptical do you want to be? Right. Right. Because they're not talking about AI as a conceptual benefit. Right. Someday, mm -hmm. they're talking about using AI right now. Correct. Right now. Ag tech, material tech, climate tech, right. you, you pick your tech. Right. You pick your field of science. They are advancing. AI is helping them advancing their work right now as we speak. Every single industry, every single company, right. every, high, every university. Unbelievable. Isn't that right? Right. It is absolutely um, going to somehow transform business. We know that. Right. We, right. I mean, we, we, it's, it's so tangible. You could, you it's, could happening it. it's happening today. It's happening today. It's happening yeah, today. Yeah. And, and, and so I, I think, I think, um, uh, I think that the, the awakening of AI chat GPT uh, triggered, uh, it, it's completely, uh, uh, incredible. And, and I, I love, I love their, uh, their, uh, uh, their velocity and their, their singular purpose of advancing this field. And, and so really, really consequential. And, and they build an economic engine that can finance the next, you know, frontier of models, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think there's a growing consensus in Silicon Valley that the whole model layer is commoditizing. Llama is, 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 is making it very cheap for lots of people to build models. And so early on here, we had a lot of model companies, mm -hmm. you know, character and inflection and, and cohere and Mistral and go through the list. And a lot of people question whether or not those companies can build the escape velocity on the economic engine that can continue funding those next generation. My own sense, is that there's going to be, that's why you're seeing the consolidation, right? It's open AI clearly has hit that escape velocity. They can fund their own future. It's not clear to me that many of these other companies can. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair kind of review of the state of things in the model layer that we're going to have this consolidation like we have in lots of other markets to market leaders mm -hmm. who can afford, who have an economic engine, an application mm -hmm. that allows them to continue to invest? Um. There's a, first of all, there's a different fundamental difference between a model yes. and artificial intelligence. Yes. Mm. Right? Yeah. A model is an essential ingredient <laughs> Correct. for artificial intelligence. It's necessary but not sufficient. Correct. Mm. And so and the and artificial intelligence is a capability, but for what? Right. Then what's the application? Right. The artificial intelligence for self-driving cars is related to the artificial intelligence for human or robots, but it's not the same. Which is related to the artificial intelligence for a chatbot, but not the same. Correct. And so, so you, you have to understand the taxonomy yes. 
of stack. Yeah, of the stack. Yeah. And at every layer of the stack, there will be opportunities, but not infinite opportunities for everybody right. at every single layer of the stack. Right. right. Now, I just said something. All you have to do is replace the word um, model with GPU. In fact, this was the great observation of our company 32 years ago that there's a fundamental difference between GPU, mm. graphics chip or GPU, versus accelerated computing. Mm. And accelerated computing is a different thing than the work that we do with AI infrastructure. It's related, but it's not exactly the same. It's built on top of each other. It's not exactly the same. And each one of these layers of that abstraction requires fundamental different skills. Somebody who's really, really good at building GPUs have no clue how to be an accelerated computing company. I can, I, you know, there are a whole lot of people who build GPUs. Yeah. And I don't know which one came to, came, you know, we invented the GPU, but you know that we're not, we're, we're not the only company that makes GPUs today. Correct. You know, and so there are GPUs everywhere. And, but they're not accelerated computing companies. And, and there are a lot of people who, do, you know, there's, they're, they're accelerators, accelerators that does uh, application acceleration, but that's different than an accelerated computing company. And so, for example, a very specialized AI application. Right. Could that, could be a very successful thing. Correct. And that is MTIA. That's right. Right. But it might not be the type of company that, that, um, had broad reach and broad capabilities. And so, so you've got to, you've got to decide where you want to be. There's opportunities probably in all these different areas, but like building companies, you have to be mindful of the, the, the shifting of the ecosystem right. and what gets commoditized over right. time, recognizing what's a feature versus a product right. versus a company. For sure. Okay. I just, I just went through. Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot of different ways you can think about this. Of so, course, there's one new entrant that has the money, the smarts, the ambition. That's X.AI. Yeah. Right. Oh, and yeah, um, well, there are reports out there that, that you and Larry and Elon had dinner. They talked to you out of 100,000 H100s. They went to Memphis and built a large, coherent super cluster in, in a matter of months. Um, you know, <laughs> so first. <laughs> three, three points don't make a line, okay? <laughs> yes, I had dinner with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ca- what you, causality what you, is... <laughs> what do you think about their ability to stand up that super cluster? And there's talk out there that they want another 100,000 H200s, right, to expand the size of that super cluster. You know, first talk to us a little bit about X and their ambitions and what they've achieved, but also are we already at the age of clusters of 200 and 300,000 GPUs? Um, the answer is yes. And then the um, uh, first first of all, uh, acknowledgement of, of achievement where it's deserved. From the moment of concept to um, a data, data center that's ready for NVIDIA to have our gear, gear there, to the moment that we uh, uh, powered it on, had it all hooked up, and it did its first training. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So uh, th- that first part, just building a massive factory, um, liquid cooled, mm-hmm. uh, energized, permitted, uh, in the short time that was done. I mean, that is that is like superhuman. Right. Yeah. There's and and as far as as far as I know, there's only one person in the world who could do that. Right. You know. I mean, Elon is singular in this understanding of engineering and and construction and large systems and um and 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 marshaling resources um, Incredible. yeah just it, it's unbelievable and and then and of course then his engineering team is extraordinary i mean the the, the software team's great the networking team's great the infrastructure team is great you know elon understands this deeply and from the moment that we decided to get to go um, the planning of uh, with our engineering team, our networking team, our, our infrastructure computing team, the software team, all of the preparation advance, mm-hmm. um, then the, all of the infrastructure, all of the logistics and the amount yeah. of technology and equipment that came in on that day, yeah. NVIDIA, NVIDIA's infrastructure and, and computing infrastructure and all that technology, to training, 19 days. <laughs> you just, you, you know what? You don't want Did 19- anybody sleep? 24 <laughs> seven. No, no question that nobody slept, but, but first of all, yeah, it's 
some 19 days is incredible, mm-hmm. but it's also kind of nice to just take a step back and just, do you know how 19, how many days, 19 days is? <laughs> it's just a couple of weeks. Yeah. Right. And, and the mountain of technology, if you were to see it is unbelievable. Yeah. All of the wiring and the networking and, you know, networking NVIDIA gear is very different than right. networking hyperscale data centers. Right. Okay. The number of wires that goes in one node, <laughs> the back of a computer is all wires. And just getting this mountain of technology integrated and all the software, incredible. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I think I think what Elon and the X team did, and um, uh, and I, I, I'm really appreciative that he, he acknowledges the, the the engineering work that we did with him and and the planning work and all that stuff. Um, but but what they achieved is is singular, never right. been done before. Just to put in perspective, hundred thousand GPUs. That's you know, easily the fastest supercomputer on the planet as one cluster. Um, a supercomputer uh, that you would build would take normally three years to plan. Right. And then they deliver the equipment and it takes one year to get it all working. Yes. We're talking about 19 days. Wow. What's well, the credit of the NVIDIA platform, right? That it's the whole processes are hardened. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Everything's already working, and yeah. and of course, there's a whole bunch of, you know, X algorithms and X framework and X stack and things like that. And we said we got a ton of integration we have to do, but the planning of it was extraordinary. Just pre-planning of it to you know. N of one is right. Elon is an N of one. Yeah. You, but you answered that question by starting off saying yes. Two hundred to three hundred thousand GPU clusters are 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 here. Yeah. Right. Um. Does that scale to 500,000? Does it scale to a million? And does the demand for your products depend on it scaling to millions? That part, the last part is no. Um, my sense is that uh, distributed training will have to work. Right. And uh, my sense is that that uh, distributed computing will be invented. Right. And and some form of federated learning and and distributed com, you know um, asynchronous distributed computing uh, is going to is going to um, uh, be discovered and I'm very very enthusiastic and very optimistic about that. Um, the the uh, uh, of course of course the um, uh, the thing to realize is that the scaling law used to be about pre pre training. Now we've gone to multi modality. We've gone to synthetic data generation. Um, Post training has now scaled up incredibly. Mm-hmm. Synthetic data generation, reward systems, reinforcement learning based, mm-hmm. and then now inference scaling right. has gone through the roof. Right. Mm-hmm. The idea that that a model before it answers your answer had already done internal inference Incredible. ten thousand times mm-hmm. is probably not unreasonable, mm-hmm. and it's probably done tree search. It's probably done reinforcement learning on that. It's probably you know, it's probably done some simulations, surely done a lot of reflection. It probably looked up some data, it looked some information, isn't that right? Mm-hmm. And so its context is probably fairly large. I mean, this this type of intelligence is, well, that's what we do. Right. That's what we do, mm-hmm. isn't that right? And so so the ability, this, this scaling, if you just did that math um, and you compound it with, you, add, you, you compound that with 4x per year, on model size and computing size. And then on the other hand, demand continues to grow in usage. Mm-hmm. Uh, do we think that we need millions of GPUs? No doubt. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is a first certainty now. Yeah. And so the question is, how do we architect it from a data center perspective? And that has, to, has a lot to do with, you know, are, are there data centers that are gigawatts at a time or are they 250 right. megawatts at a time? And, and um, uh, my sense is that, you know, you're gonna get both. I think analysts always focus on the current architectural bet. But I think mm-hmm. one of the biggest takeaways from this conversation is that you're thinking about the entire ecosystem and many years out. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea that, you know, because Nvidia is just scaling up or scaling out, it's to meet the future. It's not to, you know, not not such that, you know, you're only dependent on a world where there's a 500,000 or a million, you know, GPU cluster. It's, you know, by the time there's dist- distributed training, you'll have written, you know, the software to enable that. That's right. Remember, yeah. without Megatron yeah. that we developed with, with, some seven years ago now, yeah. the scaling of these large training jobs wouldn't have happened. Right. 
And so we invented Megatron, we invented Nickel, um, GPU Direct, right? All of the work that we did with our DMA, um, that made it possible for e easily to do um, uh, pi pipeline parallelism, you know, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all the all the model parallelism that's being done, you know, all the breaking of the distributed training and all the batching and all that, all of that stuff is is uh, uh, because we did the early work, and now we're doing the early work for the future future generation. So, so let's talk about. Strawberry and 01. Yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. So I we'll, got all the time in the world. Excellent. You guys. Well, you're you're very generous. Yeah, I've got all the time um, in the world. But first, I think it's cool that they named 01 after the 01 visa, right? Which is about recruiting the world's best and brightest, uh, you know, and bringing them to the United States. Mm -hmm. It's something I know we're both deeply yeah. passionate about. Um, so I love the idea that building a model that thinks and that takes us to the next level of scaling intelligence, mm -hmm. right, uh, is, is, is an homage to the fact that it's these people who come to the United States mm -hmm. by way mm -hmm. uh, of immigration that mm -hmm. have made it made us what we are, bring their collective intelligence to the Surely United States. Surely an alien intelligence. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. You know, it was spearheaded by our friend Noam Brown. Of course, he worked at Pluribus and Cicero when he was at Meta. How big a deal is inference time reasoning as a totally new vector of scaling intelligence, separate and distinct from, right, just building larger models? It's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. I think the, um, uh, a lot of intelligence can't be done a priori. Right. Mm. You know? And a lot of computing, uh, even a lot of computing can't be reordered. I mean, just a, you know, out of order execution can be done a priori, you know, and so a, a lot of things that can only be done in runtime. Right. And, and so, so whether you think about it from a computer science perspective or you think about it from, from a, from a intelligence pers perspective, uh, too much of it requires context. Right. Um, the circumstance, right. right? Uh, the quality, the type of answer you're looking for. Uh, sometimes just a quick answer is good enough. Right. Depends on depends on the 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 uh, um, the consequential you know impact of the answer right you know depending on the nature of the usage of that answer and so so uh, uh, some 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 answers uh, please take a night right. some answers take a week yes is that right so I could totally imagine uh, me sending off a prompt to my AI and telling it you know think about it for a night right think about it overnight don't tell me right away right I want you to think about it all night and then come back and tell me tomorrow what's your best answer and reason about it for me. And, and so I think the, the, um, uh, the, the quality, the, the segmentation of intelligence for now from a product perspective, right. there's going to be one shot versions of it. Right. For the, sure. Yeah. And then there'll be some that take five minutes, you know. And the intelligence layer that roots those questions to the right model yeah. for the right use case. I mean, we were using advanced voice mode and 01 preview last night. It, uh, for, I, was, I was coaching my son for his AP history test. Yeah. And it was like having the world's best AP history teacher yeah, right. sitting right next to you thinking yeah. about these questions. It was truly extraordinary. Again, my, my tutor is an AI today. <laughs> right. I, I'm right. serious. Of course. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. here today, yeah. which comes back to this. You know, over 40% of your revenue today is inference. Mm. But inference is about ready uh, because of chain of reasoning. Yeah. Right? It's about, it's about ready, to go up by a billion times. Right. By, yeah, by, by, the, by a million X, by a, by a right. billion X. That's right. It, that's the part that most people have, you know, haven't completely internalized. This is that industry we were talking about, but right. this is the industrial revolution. Right. That's the yeah. production of intelligence. That's right. Right? And, yeah. and it's going to go up a billion times. Right. And oh, so, yeah. uh, you, you know, everybody's so hyper focused on NVIDIA as kind of like doing training on bigger models. Yeah. Right? Isn't it the case that your revenue, if it's 50 50 today, you're going to do way more inference in the future. Yeah. Right? Then, yeah. Uh, I mean, training will always be yeah. important, but yeah. just the growth of inference is going to be way larger than we the hope. growth in training. We hope. It's almost impossible to conceive otherwise. Yeah, we hope. That's right. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, good to, it's good to go to school. Yes. But the goal is so that you can be productive in society later. And so it's good that we train these models, but the goal is to inference them, yeah. you know? <laughs> Are you already using chain of reasoning and, uh, you, you know, tools like O1 in your own business to improve your own business? Yeah. Our cybersecurity system today can't run without 
without um, uh, our own agents. Okay. Uh, we have we have uh, agents helping us design ships. Hopper wouldn't be possible. Blackwell wouldn't be possible. Ruben, don't even think about it. Um, we have digital. We have we have AI chip designers, AI software engineers, AI verification engineers, um, and we we build them all inside because yeah. you know we we um, uh, we have the ability and, and we rather we rather use it use the opportunity to explore the technology ourselves. You know, when I walked into the building today, somebody came up to me and said. You know, ask Jensen about the culture. It's all about the culture. I look at the business, you know, we talk a lot about fitness and efficiency, flat organizations that mm -hmm. can execute quickly, smaller mm -hmm. teams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, NVIDIA is in a league of its own, really. Um, you know, at about 4 million of revenue per employee, mm -hmm. about 2 million of profits or free cash flow per employee. You've built a culture of efficiency that really um, has unleashed creativity and innovation and ownership and responsibility. You've broken the mold on kind of functional management. Everybody likes to talk about all mm -hmm. of all of your uh, direct reports. Um, is the leveraging of AI the thing that's going to continue to allow you to be hyper creative while at the same time being efficient? No question. Uh, I'm hoping that, that someday, NVIDIA has 32,000 employees today. And um, we have four. We have four thousand families in Israel. I hope they're well. I'm thinking of you guys. Yes. Uh, and uh, um, I'm hoping that Nvidia someday will be a fifty thousand employee company with a hundred million, you know, AI assistants. Wow. And and they're in every single group. All right. Um, uh, we will have a whole directory of. Uh, AIs that are just generally good at doing things. We'll also have our inbox is going to full of directories of AIs that we work with that we know are right. really, really good, specialized at our skill. And so, so um, AIs will recruit other AIs to solve problems. Right. AIs will be in you know Slack channels with each other and uh, with humans, right? And with humans. And so, so we'll just be one large, you know, employee base, if you will. Uh, some of them are digital in AI. Some some of them are biological. And, and I'm hoping some of them even megatronics. You know? I, th I, th I think from a business perspective, it's something that's greatly misunderstood. You just described a company mm -hmm. that's producing the output mm -hmm. of a company with 150,000 people, mm -hmm. but you're doing it with 50,000 people. Right. Now, that's, you didn't say, I was going to get rid of all my employees. No. You're still growing the number of employees right. in the organization, but the output of that organization Right is going to be dramatically more. This this is this is often misunderstood. Um, AI is not it's not AI will change every job. Right. AI will have a a a seismic impact on how people think about work. Let's acknowledge that. Right. Um, AI has the potential to do incredible good. It has the potential to do harm. We 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 sh we have to build safe AI. Yes. We let's just make that foundational. Yes. Okay. The part that is. The part that is overlooked is when companies become more productive using artificial intelligence, it is likely that it manifests itself into either better earnings or better growth or both. Right. And when that happens, the next email from the CEO <laughs> is likely not a layoff right. announcement. Of course. Because you're growing. Yeah. And the reason for that is because we have more ideas than we can explore. Mm -hmm. And we need people to help us think through it before we automate it. Mm -hmm. And so the automation part of it, AI can help us do. Obviously, it's going to help, help us think through it as well. But it's still going to require us to go figure out what problems do I want to solve? Right. There are a trillion things we can go solve. What, right. what, what problems does this company have to go solve? And select those ideas and figure out a way to autom uh, automate and scale. And so, so as a result, we're going to hire more people as we become more productive. People forget that, you know. Yes. And 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 if you if you go back in time, obviously we have more ideas today than 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 200 years ago. That's the reason why GDPs are larger and more people are employed. And even though we're automating like crazy underneath, I th it's such an important point of this period that we're entering. One, almost all human productivity, almost all human prosperity is the byproduct of the automation yeah. and the technology of the last 200 years. Yeah. I mean, you can look at, you know, from Adam Smith and Schumpeter's creative, uh, you know, destruction, you can look at chart of GDP growth 
per person over the course of the last 200 years, and it's just accelerated. Yeah, right. Which leads me to this question. If you look at the 90s, our productivity growth in the United States was about 25 to 3% a year. Okay, and then in the 2000s, it slowed down to about 1.8%. And then the last 10 years has been the slowest productivity growth. So that's the amount of labor and capital, or the amount of output we have for a fixed amount of labor and capital. The slowest we've had on record, actually. And a lot of people have debated the, the reasoning for this, but if the world is as you just described, and we're going to leverage and manufacture intelligence, then isn't it the case that we're on the verge of a dramatic ex expansion in terms of human productivity? That's our hope. Right. That's our hope. And, and of course, you know, we live in this world, so we have direct evidence of it. Right. We have direct evidence of it, uh, either uh, uh, as isolated of a case as an individual researcher For sure. who is able to, with AI, now explore science at such an extraordinary scale right. that is unimaginable. Mm -hmm. That's productivity. Right, 100%. Measure of productivity. Or that we're designing chips that are so incredible at such a high pace and the chip complexities and the computer computer complexities we're building are going up exponentially while the company's employee base is not mm -hmm. measure of productivity. Correct. The software that we're developing better and better and better because we're using AI and supercomputers to help us. The number of employees is growing barely linearly. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, another demonstration of productivity. So whether it's I can go into, I can spot check it in a whole bunch of different industries. Yes. I could gut check it myself. Yes, yes. your right? own business. That's right. And so I, I can, you know, and, and of course you can't, you can't, um, uh, we could be overfit, uh, but the artistry of it, of course, is to, to generalize what is it that we're observing and whether this could manifest in other industries. And, and there's no question that uh, intelligence is the single most valuable commodity the world's ever known, right. and now we're going to manufacture it at scale. Mm -hmm. And we, we, all of us, have to get good at, you know, what would happen if you're surrounded by these AIs um, and they're doing things so incredibly well and so much better than you? Right. And when I reflect on that, that's my life. Right. I have 60 direct reports. Right. The reason why they're on the reason why they're on e staff is because they're world class at what they do, and they do it better than I do. Right, much better than I do. Right, I have no trouble interacting with them, mm -hmm. and I have no trouble prompt engineering them. Right. You guys, <laughs> totally. I have no trouble programming them. Right, right. And so, so I think that that's that's the thing that that people are going to learn is that they're all going to be CEOs. Right, they're all going to be CEOs of AI agents. Right. Mm -hmm. And their, their ability to uh, have the creativity, um, uh, the will, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, and, and some knowledge and how to reason, break problems down so that, so that you can program these AIs to help you achieve something like I do. Right. You know, that's called running companies. Right. Now, it's, yeah. you mentioned something, this alignment, the safe AI. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the tragedy going on in the Middle East. Um, you know, we have a lot of autonomy and a lot of AI that's being used um, in different parts of the world. So let's talk for a second about bad actors, about safe AI, um, about coordination with Washington. How do you feel today? Are we on the right path? Do we have a sufficient level of coordination? You know, I think Mark Zuckerberg has said, the way we beat the bad AIs is we make the good AIs better. Um, is uh, how would you characterize your view of how we make sure that this is a positive net bit benefit for humanity um, as opposed to you know, leaving us in this dystopian world without purpose? Mm -hmm. uh, the conversation about safety is really important and good. Yes. Uh, the, the abstracted view, this conceptual view of AI being a, a large giant neural network, not right. so good. <laughs> right, right. Okay. And the reason for that is because, because um, as we know, artificial intelligence and large language models are related, not the same. Um, I, there, there are many things that, that are being done that I think are excellent. One, uh, open sourcing models so that uh, the entire community of researchers and every single industry and every single company can engage AI yes. and go 
uh, learn how to harness this capability for their application, excellent. Number two, the, the, it is under-celebrated the amount of technology that is dedicated to inventing AI to keep AI safe. Yes. AI is to curate data, to curate information, to train an AI, AI created to align AI, synthetic data generation AI, to expand the knowledge of AI, to cause it to hallucinate less. Um, all of the AIs that are being created to, uh, to um, uh, uh, for vectorization or graphing or whatever it is, to, to inform an AI, right. guard railing AI, uh, AIs to monitor other AIs, that the system of AIs mm. to create safe AI is under-celebrated. Right. That we've yes. already built. That we're building, uh, that right. everybody yes. all over the industry, the methodologies, the red teaming, the process, mm-hmm. um, the, 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 the model cards, the, right. you know, the, the evaluation systems, the benchmarking systems, you know, all of that, the, the, all of the harnesses that are, that are being built at the right. velocity that's been built is incredible. I wonder if they, under I, celebrated. Do you guys understand? To, yes. You know, the, the, the and there's no think, there's no government regulation saying you have to do this. Yeah. Right. This is the actors in the space today who are building That's these right. AIs yeah. are taking seriously and coordinating right. around best practices right. with respect to. Uh, these critical matters. That's right, exactly. And so, so that's under celebrated, yeah. under understood. Yes. Somebody needs to 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 um, well, everybody needs to start talking about AI as a system of AIs, and system of of engineered systems, engineered systems that are that are well engineered, built from first principles, well tested, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. Regulation. Uh, remember, remember, AI is a capability that can be applied. Mm. And, and um, uh, I don't, it's necessary to, to uh, have regulation for important technologies, um, but it's, it's also don't, don't, don't overreach to the point where some of the regulation ought to be um, done, uh, most of the regulation ought to be done at the applications. Right. The FAA, NHTSA, FDA, right. you name it, all, right? All of the different, all of the different uh, ecosystems that already regulate applications right. of technology. Right. Now have to regulate the application of technology that is now infused with AI, right. and so, and so I think, I think um, uh, uh, there's don't 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 misunderstand, don't overlook the overwhelming amount of regulation in the world right. that are going to have to be activated for AI, mm-hmm. and don't rely on just one universal galactic, right. you know, AI council. <laughs> that's going to possibly be able to do this because there's a reason why all of these different agencies were created. There was a different, there's For a sure. reason why all these different uh, regulatory bodies were created. Um, we we'll go back to first principles again. I'd get in trouble by my partner, Bill Gurley, if I didn't go back to the open source point. Yeah. You guys launched a very important, very large, very capable open source model. Yeah. Um, Nemotron. Re- r- r- yeah. Recently. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, Meta is making significant contributions to yep. open source. I find when I read Twitter, you know, you have this kind of open versus closed, a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of uh, chatter about it. Yep. Um, how do you feel about open source, your own open source models, ability to keep up mm-hmm. with Frontier? Mm-hmm. That would be the first question. The second question would be, is that, you know, having that open source model and also having closed uh, source models, you know, that are powering commercial operations. Is that what you see into the future? And do those two things, does that c- create the healthy tension for safety? Mm-hmm. Um, open source versus closed source is related to sa- safety, but not only about safety. Yes. You know, and so, so for example, uh, there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having closed source models that are that are the engines of an economic model <laughs> exactly. necessary to sustain innovation. Right. Okay. Right. I, I celebrate that wholeheartedly. Right. Um, it is. It is. It is. I believe, uh, wrong-minded to be uh, closed versus open. Right. It should be closed and Plus open. Plus open. Yeah. Right. Because open is necessary for many industries to be activated. Right now, if we didn't have open source, how would all these different fields of science be able to activate, be activated on AI? Right. Right. right? Because they have to develop their own domain-specific AIs and, and they have to develop their own, using open source models, create domain-specific AIs. They're related, again, not the same. Right. 
just because you have an open source model doesn't mean you have an AI. And so you, you have to have that open source model to enable the creation of AIs. So financial services, healthcare, transportation, the list of industries, fields of science that has now been enabled as a result of open source, unbelievable. Are you seeing a lot of demand for your open source models? Our open source models, so first of all, yeah. uh, Llama downloads, right? Yeah. Obviously, yeah, Mark and the work that they, they've done, incredible, off the charts. Yes. And it completely activated and, and um, uh, engaged every single industry, every single field of science. Right, okay, right. it's terrific. Um, the reason why we did Nemotron was for uh, synthetic data generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, intuitively, the idea that one AI would, would somehow sit there and loop and generate data to learn itself, it, it, sounds, it sounds brittle. Yes. And, and um, uh, how many times you can go around that infinite loop, that loop, you know, questionable. However, uh, it's kind of, <laughs> my mental image is kind of like, like uh, you get a super smart person, put him into a, a, a padded room, close the door for about a month. You know, what, what comes out is probably not, not a smarter person. And, and so, so, but the idea that you could have, have two or three people sit around and we have, we have different AIs, we have different distributions of knowledge, and we can go QA back and forth. All three of us can come out smarter. Right. And so the idea that you can have AI models exchanging, interacting, going back and forth, debating, reinforcement wow. learning, synthetic data generation, for example, yeah. uh, kind of intuitively makes sense. suggests it makes yeah. sense, yeah. 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 And so our model, Nemotron 350B is, 340B is, is uh, the best model in the world for reward mm. systems. Mm. And so it is the best critique. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and interesting. so so um, a fantastic model for enhancing everybody else's model. So irrespective of how, how great somebody else's model is, right. I'd ha- have recommend using Nemotron 340B. Right to enhance and make it better. And we've already seen made Llama better, made uh, all the other models better. Well, we're coming to the end. Thank um, goodness. <laughs> as somebody who delivered DGX1 in 2016, <laughs> it's really been an incredible journey. Your journey is unlikely and incredible at the same time. Thank you. You survived. Like just surviving the early days was pretty extraordinary. You delivered the first DGX-1 in 2016. Mm -hmm. We had this Cambrian moment in 2022. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to ask you the question I often get get asked, which is how long can you sustain what you're doing today? With 60 direct reports, Mm -hmm. you're everywhere. Mm -hmm. You're driving this revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you having fun? And is there something else that you would rather be doing? Is this a question about the last hour and a half? <laughs> the answer is I had great, I had great time. I had great time. I couldn't imagine anything else I'd rather be doing. Uh, uh, let's see. I think it's. I don't think it's right uh, to leave the impression that that our our job mm. is fun all the time. Right. My job isn't right. fun all the time, right. nor, nor do I expect it to be fun all the right. time. Was that ever an expectation <laughs> that it was fun all the time? Um, uh, I think it's important all the time. Yeah. I, take, I don't take myself too seriously. I take the work very seriously. Right. I take our responsibility very seriously. I take our contribution and our moment in time very seriously. Uh, is that always fun? No. Yeah. But awesome. do I always love it? Yes. Uh, like all things, uh, you know, uh, whether it is, is family, friends, children, is it always fun? No. <laughs> Do we always love it? Absolutely, deeply. And so, so I, I think the, the, um, uh, how long can I do this? Uh, the, the real, the real question is how long can I be relevant? And that only matters that, that piece of information that question can only be answered with how, how am I going to continue to learn? Yeah. And I am a lot more optimistic today. I'm not saying this simply because of our topic today. I'm a lot more optimistic about my ability to stay relevant and continue to learn because of AI. Yeah. 
I use it. Every, I don't know, but I'm sure you guys do. I use it literally every day. There's not one piece of research that I don't involve AI with. There's not one question that I, even if I know the answer, I double check on it with AI. And surprisingly, you know, the next two or three questions I ask it reveals something I didn't know. That's right. You pick your topic. You pick your topic. And, and I think that, that um, AI as a tutor, AI as an assistant, um, AI as a, you know, a, 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 a partner to brainstorm with, um, double check my work. Right. Um, you know, boy, you guys, this is completely revolutionary. Yeah. And that's just, you know, I'm an information worker. I'm, you know, my output is information. And, and so I think the, the, uh, uh, the contributions that, that all have on society is, is pretty extraordinary. And so, so I think, I think the, if that's the case, if I could stay relevant like this, um, and I can continue to make a contribution. Uh, I know, I know that the the, the work is important enough yeah. uh, for me to want to continue to pursue yeah. it. Uh, and and my qual- my quality of life is incredible. So well, I mean, I'll, what's there to I'll say, about? I can't imagine. You and I have been at this for a few decades. I can't imagine missing this moment. Yeah, it's right. The most consequential moment of our That's careers. Right. Um, we're deeply grateful for the partnership. For Don't the, miss the for, next 10 years. For, for the thought partnership. Yeah. You make us smarter. Thank you. Um, and I think you're really important um, as part of the leadership, right, that's going to optimistically and safely lead this forward. Um, so thank, thank you, you for being with us. Really enjoyed it. Really Thanks, Brad. It. Thanks, Clark. Thanks. Good job. As a reminder to everybody, just our opinions, not investment advice.